Hi, this is Randall Schwartz, host of Floss Weekly. This week, Dan Lynch joins me. We're going to be talking about LensTor, a great way to replicate your data across the cluster. You're not going to want to miss this, so stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Floss Weekly with Randall Schwartz and Dan Lynch. Episode 494, recorded August 22nd, 2018. Linstore. It's time for Floss Weekly, the show about free, libre, open source software. I am your host, Randall Schwartz, Merlin at Stonehenge.com, bringing you each week the movers, the shakers, the big projects, the little projects, projects you may be using every day and not aware of it, projects you may want to download right after the show and play with it. Joining me once again is my lovely and talented co-host, Dan Lynch. Dan, welcome back to the show. Hey, it's good to be back. I always like being called lovely and talented. Thank you. I think I think actually what I don't think I started that. I think actually Aaron started that on one of the shows, and uh, I've sort of adopted mm. it. So it's kind of fun. It's 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 part of my shtick. You know that's the way this works. So uh, where are you? <laughs> I've been, where are I've you been called much worse, but uh, yeah, it's okay. nice. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, and we're not doing a Linux Outlaws show this time. Even right, the last time right. we started, that. yeah, that was that was a fun show. It was a really fun show. Got a lot of good feedback on that. That was wonderful and uh, cool. And uh, where are you speaking to us from? I think probably Liverpool. Yeah, my usual hideout at Liverpool. Don't be fooled by the cactuses behind me here, if I can get my thumb in the right place for the video people. A few cactuses on the thing. They're not native to this area. That's why they're in pots. So I'm in Liverpool in the UK, which is not hot enough to to, uh, grow cactuses outside particularly. And I am actually out in uh, just north of Fort Lauderdale. I think it's uh, Pomona, Pomona, Pomona Beach, something like that. And I'm on the 10th floor. It's a beautiful view. I'm going to hold this up for a second. Let's see if I can get that in the video there. That's actually a picture of what I'm looking at right now, which is really, really amazing. I'm out here for 11 days to uh, basically stage myself as I'm on my way to uh, Dragon Con in a week and a half. And I figured I'd start out by being on the East Coast so that I would be able to uh, – have a really short flight coming up instead of uh, flying all the way from the West Coast over to here. So I am currently on the road. I'm on a possibly dicey Wi-Fi, so there might be a few dropouts occasionally and stuff like that. But the show's not about us. The show is about the guest and the project they want to talk about. Today, no exception to that. Our guest today is uh, – scroll, scroll, scroll. Scrolling the wrong place. I should be more prepared than this. Our show today Hello. is – yeah, Philip. There we go. That's the word. Philip Reisner. There we go. Uh, and we're going to be talking about Linstore, which is uh, a project uh, that is going to do – well, here, I have the text right here. Uh, it's High Availability DRDB. So it's an open source management tool designed to manage block storage devices for large Linux server clusters. And its primary use case is currently to provide persistent Linux block storage for Kubernetes and OpenShift environments. So – First off, when you have a cluster of machines, they all have to talk to disk, and you want the disk to be high performance and high availability. And those uh, come as a consequence of having software that replicates data across multiple machines uh, and replicates data in a way that uh, if one of the machines goes down, you can recover the data and and move all the rest of the data around so it still has the same number of uh, replications. High availability is coming uh, is, is that, and then high performance is because uh, each machine has access to some part of the data directly uh, so that uh, you know you, you can get local access instead of just doing everything over the debt. That's about all I know about this so far. <laughs> Dan, can you fill in anything else? <laughs> um, yeah, I've, I've had a quick look at it, and um, I am interested in the comparisons to some of the other um, options out there. Like uh, I've been doing some stuff with ZFS or, or ZFS, as you guys call it yep. over there, um, recently. Sure. So that'd be interesting. And there's Ceph and all kinds of other things that we could talk about. But um, it looks really interesting. It's in the Linux kernel. So um, that's a really good sign. And um, yeah, I would look forward to learning more about it. Well, there's no reason not to bring on our guests. And so let's go ahead and bring on Philip. Philip, welcome to the show. Hello, Dan. <clears throat> good to be here. Okay. Hi, and where are you, spe- where are you speaking to us from? Uh, I'm located in in Austria, so that's Mm. only a little bit south of Germany, and Mm -hmm. our native language here is German, uh, but, well, that's to the show in English, right? Yes, uh, Uh, right. That would be good for us, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I took... took I took exactly one year of German in high school, and uh, I for uh, the first time I went to Germany 30 years later, I had no idea. All I could do was tell the time, and I went, well, that's stupid. My 
my phone tells me what time it is. That's the only thing I remember how to say in German. So what a waste of time. I wish I'd taken two years of Spanish instead. I would have been that much further ahead in most of my travels. Yeah. So let's talk about Lindstorm. So what problem are people solving when they are reaching for Lindstorm? Yeah, okay. So why, why, why did we do it, right? Why did we yes. start it? Um, <laughs> so when... So we are we are coming from from the Linux side, right? So so I have personally I have been working on DVD. That's this replication driver for Linux, and a version of it is upstream. And uh, the most recent version is is not upstream, but we will merge it upstream, Linux upstream, at some day. Sure. So we are coming from this Linux background, and we understand. Uh, the challenges that are out there to solve uh, when it comes to software-defined storage. And when we looked at the solutions that were around, and you already mentioned Ceph, for example, um, we got the feeling, well, Ceph is, is really great. It is an object store, and then on top of the object store, you, you add a layer that gives it block semantics again. And then this is used to do I.O. for virtual machines. And we just had the idea, well, uh, we don't like the idea to put an object layer in between. So what we want to do or what we are doing is uh, that we take the Linux I.O. stack, which works for block devices as it is, and we uh, leverage on all the features that this block I.O. stack has, like LVM, the Linux Volume Manager, uh, like the software rate code, like uh, bcache and dmcache, that are two functions that allow you to use SSDs as caches for hard disks, right? Um, and uh, CFS or ZFS. Um, and we're building on these building blocks, and if necessary, we're also building on the building block we know very well, which is DVD. And yeah, what's what's um, one property of all these building blocks is that they are compatible on the data plane. So you can mix and, uh, mix and match them as you need it, right? So you can put an LVM on top of a RAID, on top of a software RAID. But if you really want to do, you can also create a software RAID out of, of two logic volumes. So they're all compatible on that layer. Um, but in case you have used them, you noticed that all these things come with their own management tools, right? So there yeah. are the, the LVM commands to manage LVM. There is DM rate, no, MD rate for the software rate and so on. So there, there are many tools, right? And what, what Linstore is about is um, Linstore is a distributed uh, system. So you have daemons running on a bunch of nodes. And these demons will configure uh, these building blocks we have on Linux to create something what you need in that <laughs> in that moment. And so this this distributed system comes with an API, uh, and then we have connectors from that API to let's say Kubernetes, but we also have a, co a connector to OpenStack Cinder, and we yeah. have one to Proxmox, and we, we will create more as projects are around that can make use of software-defined storage. So, cool. And so, so, so let, let me make sure I understand what, what this is doing then, because um, uh, I know probably a bit of our audience, they, their eyes are already glazed over just a little bit, so I'm going to see if I can kind of bring it back down to, down to earth for, for most of us, including me. So... Ultimately, this is providing uh, what would essentially be 
data blocks. So uh, we'd, we'd, we would build a file from. So rather than something like Ceph that's trying to do th something with objects, we're actually just going to present block 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 in a contiguous sequence. And it's up to the applications then to write stuff in and out of that. But what you're doing as well is you're replicating this on multiple machines, providing high availability and maybe high performance by having some of it distributed across multiple machines. Is that is that fair to say this is what it's doing? Yeah. So we are we are working on block level. That's that's correct. And and you are all using block devices when you use Linux because. You have your Linux root file system on some hard disk or SSD, and the hard disk or SSD is present is abstracted in Linux as a block device, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so what Linstore presents you is let's call it a, a, a virtual SSD or virtual block device uh, hard sure. disk, right? And it, yeah. it it creates that by by replicating data over physical <laughs> SSDs or hard disks, right? And sure. the, the, the main difference uh, let, now let's when we compare it to Ceph is um, that we built this data path uh, with the building blocks that are in the Linux kernel. Um, and then you, you mount the file system on top of it and maybe use it for a container or you, you put the um, image of a virtual machine on it, and then you can use it for virtualization uh, purposes, right? Okay, and so um, would I, hmm, does, does this improve performance then? It, I, I mean, I'm, I keep making up that because it's across multiple yeah. machines and they all have some form of local storage perhaps, uh, that it's faster, but is, is is this actually is this is this just about having high availability, or is it also about getting better performance? Okay, okay, let's let's talk about the performance aspect. So the 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 massive change we are facing recently is that the block devices got way faster, right? When we look back at hard disk drives, we were talking about a few hundred IOPS. Um, then we had the SSDs, uh, which we are still connecting through the traditional buses like SATA and SAS. And these SSDs mm -hmm. are give you like thousands, maybe ten thousands of IOPS. So IOPS is mm -hmm. IO operations per second. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I would, I think, every recent laptop comes with an SSD these days. And then. Um, as this technology is so fast, uh, uh, the industry replaced the bus. We connect these SSDs to the host machine. And so then we enter the world of NVMe. So that's the abbreviation is for non-volatile memory express. Uh, it started out as a specification for a PCIe card. So the first NVMe drives were P were PCIe cards, and these things gave uh, give you performance like up to a hundred thousand IOPS or maybe two hundred thousand IOPS. Wow! And so just remember back about a hard disk drive. So we are now a thousand times faster than a hard disk drive, right? Um, and this is not the end. Uh, of the evolution. Now Intel came out with these Optane devices. Um, and here we see IOPS uh, up to up to a million IOPS per single Optane drive if it is connected by, by the NVMe bus. Um, so this is the challenge in hardware. And when we look at Ceph, you need to understand it, it was created when hard disk drives were around. So it was built under the assumption we need to distribute the virtual block device over many hosts to, to get reasonable performance. Um, things have changed in the meantime. 
Mm -hmm. So you can get superb performance by just using a single NVMe device in in a single server, or let's say two in two servers to have it redundant. So uh, distributing it is no longer uh, crucial to achieve high performance. What's crucial these days is to make your software faster, because now the main mm -hmm. overhead is the software that sits in the data path. And here comes the re here comes the the reason why having an object layer in between that makes you know that makes things more comp more expensive in the way every time you cross a four megabyte boundary you have to look up a different object. Um, so that's all code you execute in the data path. And uh, in the, with the current hardware constraints, it is more valuable to have this data path to be very cheap, you know, as little instructions as, as, pos uh, as feasible. <laughs> mm -hmm. so, so what we do with LinStore and, 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 and the software we are working on Sorry, um, um, I was just wanting to ask a bit about the history of like the project and how you did you you started the project then? I'm guessing. Yeah, <laughs> I, I started to work on DBD that was back in the year 2000 actually. Hmm. So that's quite some time oh. back. Yeah, and we so I mean I don't want to hazard a guess at your age, but were you a student then or something? But I'm guessing, uh, judging by. Uh, yeah, Co judging by your possible correct. age, I'm assuming you were probably you were. How did you come to start it? Were you were you kind of just out of college, or how does that work? Yeah, so so here I, I was studying computer science here in in Vienna, Vienna Technical mm -hmm. University. Um, and when you graduate from that, you need to do this uh, diploma thesis. Um, and for that, you select, you know, some topic and 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 work on 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 that for like uh, two semesters. And I mm. I wanted to do something that that's not just disappearing the library of the university, but that might be used in real world. Yeah. And so with, with that in mind, I was looking around for topics, and then one of the institutes had the topic: well, do hard disk mirroring over the network. Mm. And when I, in the moment I saw it, I said, mm, maybe, oh, I thought it's boring, but when, then I, you know, went home <laughs> on the bus and thought about it and realized, oh, this is actually a, a good problem to solve because it enables all this high availability without the need for um, shared storage. And shared storage in itself can be a, a single point of failure of an AJA system. So t this is how I got mm. into, into all this subject. Yeah, and, and I guess at the time, I mean, obviously you couldn't know what was going to happen in the future. But I mean, we've now we're now in a world where everything is is you know is you know we've got federated services, we've got all these different things. It's everything so closely kind of networked. Obviously, I'm going to use the buzzword here, but you know the cloud and all that. This all relies on this thing that you're. Uh, that that you've come to, you know, that you started. So, is that a, a nice feeling to know that you were kind of ahead of the curve a little bit there? Of course. <laughs> 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 well, l let let me add a, a bit to that. So, w when mm. when I started to work on that, so you know, uh, networking technology was just going from ten megabit per second to a hundred megabit per second, mm. and at that time it was not yet considered feasible to do IO over the network, just because network was even slower than hard disk drives. <laughs> mm. Okay, now a few years later, we have now 10 gigabit Ethernet, like the standard in the data center, 100 gigabit Ethernet available. And I'm pretty sure things like 200 gigabit Ethernet or in 200 gigabit InfiniBand is definitely in the, in the standardization mm. works. So mm -hmm. network bandwidth is enormous, right? Mm -hmm. And so doing I.O. over the network is now something that's absolutely reasonable these days. Mm. 
And um, I, I noticed that um, you, you got into the, you're in the Linux kernel, uh, and that, you know, was in, I think, 2009. There we go. Yeah, 2009, Linus Torvalds um, agreed to put it in the mainline kernel. So was that a difficult process? Because I know, without getting too political about it, I know that it can be difficult to, to get uh, the kernel developers to accept things sometimes and get them in. So was he... Was he keen on this, or would he, would, did you get nice kind of responses from them? Yeah, well, it was a difficult <laughs> process. <laughs> so I think we started like three years earlier, and mm -hmm. we were completely clueless. Mm. So, you know, they, they, there are formal things like following the, the coding standard, you know, where to put the curly braces and where spaces are allowed and where not in the C source code. So mm. you need to get that right uh, uh, so that they even look at it. And mm. and yeah, and then at that point, there was the um, uh, Linus Torvalds gave, gave out mm. the direction, okay, everything that, uh, well, I'm not sure how to phrase it, but he, mm. he said everything that Everything that is useful for a bigger audience should be on the mainline kernel. So mm -hmm. because then then this tree wide changes uh, also reaches those kind of drivers. And for sure there were there was discussions. Um, but after we did our homework, like you know following the coding style, um, mm -hmm. talking to the right people at conferences, um, the maintainer of the block subsystem that CNs Expo. Mm -hmm. um, decided uh, to take it, and yeah, then I, I, mm. I'm still, I still need to continue my learning process and following yeah. the e exact procedures. Uh, the kernel maintainers uh, want to receive the patches, and that of course mm -hmm. evolves also over time. Um, but yeah, I, I like to work with these guys. They are mm. really developers on the highest level on this planet yeah and they seem i mean i'm not um, a developer of any of that standard so but i have been on the, the linux kernel mailing list a few times which is infamous for its uh for, for basically for being quite hostile if you um as you say don't follow the coding standards or you do things that they just they think are not very smart um so but they are they're quite pragmatic and and if the solution is is the best solution or a good solution then they'll often put it in so uh, were they accepting then? It sounds like it sounds like on the whole they accepted, you know, accepted that it was a good technical solution, and then they were happy to kind of move that into the kernel. Yes, so I I got accepted, and you know, it's it's many different players, and all of them have their own opinions. But what counts mm. is that it is in. Mm. Um, yeah, and, yeah, you know, the, yeah. The, the Linux kernel is one kind of how an open source project can be set up. So we have, you know, Linus mm -hmm. Torvalds at the top and mm -hmm. he's the boss of everything. And then he has his deputies and everything works in a, I would call it a, a network of trust, right? You establish your reputation and that allows you to get, to get patches and changes in. And that's a lot less formal than what we see in other projects like an OpenStack where we have all these elections and very formal processes. Um, mm. Yeah, I, I grew mm. up with the Linux way of how it works. So, so maybe this is the mm. reason why I like it. Hey, so uh, I wanted to jump in here because you were talking about, um, this is in the kernel, of course, already, is was a new protocol invented for for uh, Linstore, or was there already protocols to go machine to machine over the wire, uh, transmitting and replicating data? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So the 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 data protocol we use that that is DOBD. So this this we invented um, for the data replication to build HA systems. Um, starting back in the year 2001, evolved over the time a lot, and now we use this as a data transport protocol. So that's there. And the, the Linstore 
um, part that's all sitting in user space and that's like the control plane so that controls how these data paths are then set up and yeah linstop became a, a big project pretty fast so it it, it is now more than a hundred thousand lines of code Mm. And it is created by mainly by a team of four in working at Limbit. Mm. And yeah, they are doing a great job. So tell me, tell me about the community then. So we have you have this project, you have this uh, company Linbit. Uh, uh, is all the development being done by people that work for Linbit? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so let, let me let me look at the two parts we're talking about let, uh, about DBD and Linstore. So so okay. DBD is the kernel component, <laughs> and as that, it is a pretty high let's call it entry hurdle, right? Because there are not so many developers out there which are familiar writing kernel code, um, and. These days, you have that most kernel developers are employed by, you know, some Linux distributor or some other company having interest in some subsystem of Linux being developed. So they all follow their tasks, right? N none of them is bored on a rainy Sunday and looking, hey, what cool stuff could I do? <laughs> So the, the number of contributions in the DVD area uh, is pretty low. Um, from time to time, we engage with customers and then the engineers realize, oh, that's all open source. And then they contribute something back. But it's when, but that's, that's rather small. So kind of contributions we get in if is if there are three wide changes in the Linux kernel, uh, then these changes are of course also applied to to the DVD driver. So yeah, that's our kind of contributions that, that reach us there. Yeah, and then when we look at the Linstore side, um, Linstore itself is developed in Java. Uh, and as such, it, it has, a, I think, a m much lower entry hurdle for developers to join. Um, and we have seen prog uh, we have seen interest, uh, but not, but at this point, not many actual contributions. I guess this is since Linstor is still new, but we have seen con contributions in the form of packaging it in containers. Um, and this automate DevOps automation around it. Um, but I expect that we will see more contributions from outside Linbit to Linstore very soon. Yeah, so, um, so is this the kind of thing, I'm still trying to figure out exactly what the use case is for this, and especially since you have adapters for Kubernetes and, uh, and OpenStack. Is this the kind of thing that I would... Uh, used for my auto scaling uh, when I'm uh, rolling out, you know, more hits per second, and I need to have more replicated storage or more um, a high availability storage for something, say, uh, sitting in uh, AWS. Mm -hmm. um, when 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 you ask the question how to do storage for OpenStack, you will get very different answers depending on who you ask, right? So, so if, I think we have another ask, guest on the we have another guest on the channel. Can you uh, can you see if you can uh, possibly? Uh, it sounds like a small child. Is there some way to? Yes, quiet? my five year old son sneaked in. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so he has escaped Sorry. my wife and oh, <laughs> oh no. okay. so, well, sorry anyway. for that it, it's almost <gasps> the point where we can't hear you so I'm just saying we really kind of need to take care of that so if you, if you can alright go ahead Sorry, continue, your, continue your answer please oh. sorry for interrupting <laughs> okay uh, help me a second to pick up the thread again <laughs> <laughs> um 
Where have you been? Uh, well, I, I was asking, would I reach for this if, say, I was doing something, say, auto scaling in AWS, or you know, and then it would talk to to Kubernetes or or, or OpenStack, whatever I'm doing to do my auto scaling, and then it would know how to attach more and more storage that are that's high availability to my application. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Got it. Um, yeah. So. Um, OpenStack clusters or Kubernetes clusters, um, you can either use offerings on the public cloud, like in AWS or Google Compute Engine or Google Com Kubernetes Engine. Mm -hmm. um, and some some co companies decide to that they want to have it on premise, like let's say for regular. Uh, uh, for reasons like you know they have to keep the data in their own data centers blah 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 regulation right um and then you come to the question how do i real how do i create the storage for my openstack or my kubernetes mm -hmm. and there you will get very different answers depending on who you ask right so the traditional storage vendors want to sell you their storage boxes and and then you end up in the situation that you use an open, open source container orchestrator or open source uh, infrastructure as a service orchestrator like OpenStack and proprietary stor storage in the back end. So mm -hmm. this is okay for some users. Others want to go the open source way, right? And what we do is let's go the open source way. Let's build the whole storage tier also with open source tools. And when it comes to to taking advantage of the performance of NVMe drives, uh, there is even another good reason to go that way. Yeah, and, and how it works is, so you would either have a pool of dedicated nodes to do your storage, or you could go hyper-converged. So have, you know, generic, have one kind of node, let's say you're using the x86 platform and use uh, the same pool of nodes to host the containers and to host the storage devices. And mm -hmm. going hyper-converged has the advantage that if the placement is done clever, uh, that read operations can be carried out without even touching the network, right? Because then you make sure that a, one replica of the volume is on a node where the container or the VM runs. So these are challenges we we like to solve. Awesome, awesome. And how is uh, how is Linbit being funded? Um, we are self-funded, so so it 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 literally started with you know five founders, four four others like me, yeah, <laughs> out out of university, putting together like you know a few thousand euros and starting the company and starting with you know earning nothing in the in the in the in the first few months, right, and and out of that. Out of that, we are growing it slowly and organically since 2001. And today we are a, a, a company of 30 people, where 20 of us are located in, in Vienna, Austria, and 11, 11 are located in or near Portland, Oregon. Yay, my home. Actually, so that's cool. Um, so how... But again, how, what, where's the money coming in from? Are you selling services? Are you uh, selling consulting, uh, selling yeah, training? So what, what's what's the deal? Um, the main business model is to sell support subscriptions. Sure. And uh, with that, you get access to you know repositories where we package everything nicely in RPM or Debian packages. Um, and you get access to to the support system we run. So. So you can in open tickets and you know different support levels, 
where we have a 24 by 7 schedule and answer your questions within an hour, all that kind of stuff. So this is the main income, the main source of income. And trainings and custom consultings, that's the, the smaller part of the business. It must be convenient that having people in both Portland and Vienna that you can provide 24-hour coverage without having to keep people up in the middle of the night. Exactly, exactly. So so we tell our German-speaking customers, keep in mind, if you open a ticket during the night, write it in English. <laughs> <laughs> yes, perfect, perfect. Mm. And what, what license did you choose and why? Um, so the kernel ports are GPL, um, just to be compatible with the Linux kernel, of course, and uh, GPL version 2. And the user space parts like uh, Linstore, uh, here we have GPL version 3. And um, yeah, just we do proper okay. open source software. So GPL is our choice. Mm. And we don't mm. like the BSD license yes, since that's like too liberal. Mm. <laughs> um, Okay, so well, I, I agree with you. Like, not that we, we're going to specify licenses on here, but I, I do. Uh, I like your license choice, shall I say? Um, <clears throat> so I was looking at um, some of the information that you sent over, uh, Philip, and I, I use Proxmox quite a lot at home. Um, it's mainly just for my own home use, if I'm honest. But if for anyone who doesn't know, um, Proxmox is um, a Debian-based. Uh, distribution which um, helps you to well makes it easy to to manage things like KVM instances LXC containers uh, and so on through their web interface and they, they do uh, they add some extra repos and stuff but the uh, the reason I was mentioning it is you, you talk there's an article on your um, site here about using Linstore on Proxmox VE now my my current setup is I've just recently changed from um, an uh, um, MDA DM I don't know how you say that like Madam or whatever software RAID setup anyway to ZFS and it took me about two weeks to get it all working. Um, would would I use Linstore instead of ZFS or would that be on top of ZFS mm -hmm. and what would be the advantages of that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, we sort we support. Um, to use ZFS as a backend for uh, for Linstore. So mm -hmm. if you would put Linstore in place, you have the choice to either use LVM or ZFS. And if you go with ZFS, then you know, then it does uh, set walls in the back. And with mm. with Linstore, you, you would create a, like a let's call it a virtual pool that you call, mm. let's say, two-way redundant. And if you have more than two nodes, you could also have a pool three-way redundant, right? Okay. And even if you have, yeah. even if you have yeah. 10 nodes, you know, let's assume you create two pools, two-way redundant, three-way redundant. If you hap uh, happen to have hard disks and SSDs in all of your 10 nodes, you could yeah, create yeah. Pools, pools like two-way redundant on SSD, three-way redundant on SSD, two-way redundant on HDD, right? Yeah. And then so it the sounds a little itself, bit like, sorry, go on. No, sorry. go on. I was just going to say, it sounds a little bit like, um, and, and I'm conscious that you're in Austria as I say this, but like a Swiss army knife almost, you know, that it, it's like, it's allowing me, so I can see how you're saying it would be, it would make it more flexible basically. In my home situation, I'm using a very limited set of hardware, so I'm not, I haven't got tons of nodes and stuff, so it probably doesn't, Maybe I'm not seeing the advantages of it for me personally, but I can see what you mean. So if I had lots of different types of stories that I needed to talk to, you, Linstore would allow me to not worry about where it was or what kind of storage it was, but just you know see it as a transparent layer. Is that more accurate? Yeah, yeah, that's that's a pretty accurate view of it. Yeah, and as you say, for most home users, it's good enough to have the data on a RAID set, right? But mm. So starting with small businesses, you you get, you, you know, you worry about downtime, and then you prefer to have your data replicated. So if uh, you know a power supply of a node fails, you don't need to replace that. But 
you can mm. immediately restart the virtual machine on a, on another node in your setup, right? Yeah, that is very cool. And and very quickly, we talked about Ceph at the start, which is something I mentioned, which is an alternative for this. And um, I know that in Proxmox, Ceph seems to be quite heavily pushed. It's already in the graphical interface. You can just enable Ceph things. So um, is, is the goal maybe to try and get them to add Linstore as well? Because I know you can add it yourself, but it, it's not in the installer. I, don't, I didn't see it in the installer. Yeah, that, that's correct. So... Um, you need to keep in mind that our our Proxmox connector is still very new. Um, so as soon as everything is a little settled, we will for sure ask the, the Proxmox people if a bit more nice integration is possible. Let's see what happens. Mm -hmm. Hey, so... Um uh, we've actually had this question a couple times in the uh, chat room. Uh, we have a live chat room during the taping. Uh, Emily, uh, I think is uh, Emily the Strange, has a couple times, I think, tried to hint at what's, and I'll, I'll make it a bigger question than what she was asking. Uh, what What's the authentication and authorization across the wire? Can someone be eavesdropping and see all the blocks going back and forth, or is there some sort of layer of encryption on top of that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so for the for the control part, so uh, so Lint store itself, um, that can use SSL. So you know because Lint store might send shared secrets and things over its connections. So here uh, SSL is possible. Uh, f for the data plane itself. Um, that's usually, well, that's not encrypted. So think of it like an iSCSI, right? If you run iSCSI over an Ethernet and the attacker has gained the possibility to either drop on, on this Ethernet segment, he will literally mm -hmm. be able to capture all the reads and writes as they fly over the Ethernet segments. So the same is true for the DVD protocol. So what we do have is uh, that the uh, connection will be uh, authenticated by a shared secret. And Linster mm -hmm. puts the share, shared secret at, at the ends. So when the TCP connection for the data path is established, you know, that's only possible if the shared secret match. Um, so that, that at least uh, prevents an intruder to connect to the port and ask for every block, right? Because the intruder doesn't have the shared secret. Uh, but yeah, the data plane traffic is not encrypted as of now. Maybe a feature that comes a little down the road. And this may be more a DRDV question than a Linstore question, but if you can also answer for me, because I'm curious, um, how, does, how does the failover and Resynchronization work. What's the sort of methodology for that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so DBD itself is only a replication technology, so replicating data. Um, in the old world, you would combine it with um, a cluster manager like Pacemaker. Some listeners might know the term heartbeat, so that was even a um, before pacemaker and that would do then things like taking over the ip address bringing up the ip address on a new node activating the file system restarting the service uh, and in the new world when we have software defined storage and let's say proxmox or openstack then it is this uh, virtualization orchestration in, in in the case of Proxmox, it's Proxmox itself. You know, Proxmox sees okay, one of the hypervisor nodes is dead. There was a VM running that is marked that this VM should be kept HA kept running. So what is Proxmox doing? It restarts the VM on one of the surviving hypervisors, and it gets access to the same data, and that's provided by by DBD and Linstore. 
Okay, and who else is in this space? Uh, I'm sure there's other people that have also wanted to solve the same problem. So who are you competing against and what's your advantage? Um, so in the in the old world, when we think about DVD for HA, then the competitors are mainly in the from the proprietary space. So there was a very or there is a Veritas product. There's a product from a company called now Sios. It mm -hmm. started under the name Steel Eye. Um, so that are proprietary competitors. And they are still in the market since, you know, big organizations sometimes standardize on these products. So, and, you know, that sometimes it comes from the Solaris heritage. And then they also use the same product for HA on their Linux uh, installations. Um, then, yeah, for this failover replication, I don't, I'm not aware of another open source solution. And oh. now when we look at, at software defined storage, where we are active with Linstore, then there is, of course, Ceph, we mentioned that multiple times. Um, and so some, to a certain extent, also ClusterFS is active in that area. Um, so these are the main open source players. Um, there is a project from Germany called BGFS. That's a file system. You can use that for similar purposes. Um, it's open source, but has a, a license that is a little bit more restrictive. So let's say Debian would not include it. <laughs> Mm, mm, okay. Hey, we're almost out of time, but is there anything that we didn't ask yet that you want to make sure our audience is aware of before we have to let you go? Um, you covered it pretty, pretty well. <laughs> we try. <laughs> <laughs> we try. <laughs> and, and unfortunately, that's a difficult question to answer. Now, that's why I was late saving it for the end. Well, I have to save it for the end because otherwise it wouldn't make any sense. But it's like you have to think about you have to think about all the things. Yeah, let's ask that at the beginning. Is there anything we haven't asked yet that you want to you want to talk about? Yeah. No, no. Uh, but I mean, it's like uh, so. So the problem is to come to answer that question. You have to think of all the things we talked about, and then you have to do a set subtraction of all the things you wanted to talk about. <laughs> That's tough to do in a mm -hmm. in a few seconds. So you need a diff. I, I can, you need a diff thing. Basically, yeah, diff. Don't yeah, you? diff. That, uh, that diff. would do it. Yeah. That would definitely do it. <laughs> uh, um, I do also want to ask, though, since this is an open source project, is there any kind of people that uh, you want to ask our audience to see if they want to help work with this project uh, that you're particularly lacking uh, currently contributing to the project? Okay. Yeah. Um, so, yes, we run it as an open source project, but we also run it as a company, right? Right. Um, so the most value we take out of the open source users is that they use our software and report if there's something wrong. Mm, yeah. So, uh, so, so my ask is everybody out there who has a Proxmox and thinks about, oh, replication or two notes, notes would, would be cool. Please try our stuff. If there is something you don't like, uh, come to our mailing list, shoot us a mail on the mailing list, uh, get in touch on, on the IRC channel. Just mm -hmm. tell us your experiences. Um, f you know, from point of view of, of a company, we always care for our support customers first. And so sometimes we are not super responsive on the user mailing list, but usually there's a, one of us hangs out there and answers questions. Uh, and we see all of the comments and we take all this input and that steers our development in the end, right? Sure. Sure. So, all right. And so... So um, I have to ask two required questions or else my audience actually yells at me. So uh, what's your favorite text editor? <laughs> I am an old school Emacs guy. Yay! Yay! 
Yay, Emacs! Yay! Yay! All right, good. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Thank you very much for that answer. It's the first time in months I think somebody says Emacs, so that's uh, that's wonderful. There's actually, I presume you mean GNU Emacs, of course, right? Um, oh, there's actually a little bit of there's a little bit of me in every copy there. I wrote the pretty printer. The thing that takes a cool. S expression and, and prints it out nicely indented, I wrote that. And Richard Stallman called it brilliant and wanted to make sure it became part of the core distribution. So I, there's a little bit of me in every copy of Max, which is really nice. <laughs> and now, and now let's go with cool. the other one. I'm, I, I'm, I I'm, use the software every day. <laughs> That's great. That's great. That is awesome. So uh, I I can't see the same for your software yet. I I don't, all I have is a single machine, so I really don't need replication. But uh, maybe uh, maybe someday I'll have a, a big cluster somewhere. Uh, now the other question is, uh, what's your favorite scripting language? Um, uh, nowadays Python. Okay. Um, I I have to admit I'm coming from Perl. Yay! Yay! Another one! Another one! I want another one! Yay! I'll take that as a point. I'll take that as a point in my column. Yes. <laughs> he did say coming but from I, Pearl, Randall. That implies well, going away from it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, when, when you look at as scripts is growing, you know, they get so ugly in Pearl. And oh. Python keeps <laughs> okay. You know, okay. You have to well, admit that. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, Philip, it's been great having you on the show talking about uh, uh, Linstore, and uh, hopefully for the people for whom this is appropriate, they'll uh, look at it as a as a reasonable solution for the problem space. And uh, appreciate you chatting with us today. Thank you, Randall. Thank you. It was a great time Dan, here. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Great. Great. Thanks. That was uh, Philip Reiser talking to us about Linstore. What do you think, there, Dan? Yeah, really interesting. I think like you just said, Randall, about the whole, um, uh, you know, the n need for, for it. I, I, I mean, I can see totally why it's it's in enterprise and so on. And this is really the sort of thing that Aaron would have been really good for, actually, because he <laughs> does a lot of the distributed storage stuff. At home, I've got, I was talking about Proxmox, I've got uh, basically one node in my house. So yeah. um, I, I, as great as this seems, I don't know how I would utilize it. But having said that, I can see why. If you if I'm using Proxmox essentially as like a sledgehammer to crack a walnut, as we say over here, for my home setup wow. for VMs and stuff. But um, if I were in a data center, I can totally see why this would be really useful. And interesting that there aren't really a lot of. So it's interesting that he was saying there are no other open source competitors because that's that's it's really good that they're in this space then because right. um, it sounds as though it's quite a, an important project. Well, you think the people that are building out the uh, OpenStack and Kubernetes world um, uh, mm -hmm. would have something like this already in place, but it sounds like it's it's an adapter that fits in that, managing the storage for that. Um, so, yeah, that sounds pretty cool. Anyway, mm -hmm. uh, let's go ahead and uh, wrap up the show, which means I'm going to start talking about who's coming up next, which is next week. We have, uh, and I'll be right in this very same location again, looking out at the very same ocean. Well, is it ever the same ocean twice? Hmm. No, well, the same named ocean. How about that? That'll work. <laughs> mm -hmm. Atlantic. Um, so uh, coming up next week is Hacks, which is an open source tool aiming to make online course creation accessible to all instructors. I hope by all they mean also me. Because <laughs> I, I do want to do some more online stuff, and it sounds like uh, this would help me out. Following that, we have uh, the first of our series of crypto question or crypto shows uh monero which is cryptocurrency private untraceable and fungible so that'll be fun uh ion who uh canceled on us at the last minute a few weeks ago is coming back that's a multi-tier system designed to address unsolved questions of scalability and interoperability in blockchain networks so that's two blockchain hmm. shows in a row uh sanoid <laughs> is uh, uh aaron i believe is actually going to be the coast on this show it's a policy-driven snapshot management and replication tools and currently using Z. FS, I'll pronounce it your way, for underlying next gen storage <laughs> with explicit plans to support ButterFS when ButterFS becomes more reliable. Boy, well, well, that could be a while. <laughs> and primarily intended for Linux, but BSD is supported and reasonably frequently tested. Just out of the schedule since the last time I did this show is Vaden, Vaden, V. V-A-A-D-I-N, Vaden, which is a Java-based web development platform. They still make these things? I think they started this back in 2000. <laughs> so, yeah, but apparently they're still doing it. They're still doing Java on a web. All right, and uh, following that will be uh, Vicky Brasur, who's going to talk to us about contributing to open source in general, but she has a new book out. So uh, I saw her at... Um, 
it was the Pearl Conference, I guess, a few weeks ago, and she did one of the keynotes, and it was on uh, the importance of the ecosystem, how we're actually poisoning the ecosystem for some projects, uh, possibly even including Pearl, uh, but basically how not to do that by uh, welcoming new people and being more tolerant of people's initial um, uh, naivety and things like that. Just added a schedule as well since last week. We have Sway. Sway, and I don't understand all this because I don't run Linux, but Sway is a tiling Wayland composite and drop-in replacement mm. for the i3 window manager for X11. And it works with your existing i3 configuration and supports most of i3's features, plus a few extras. So I don't, I run OS X, uh, is it OS X anymore? No, it's Mac OS. I run Mac OS on my Mac, mm. so I don't know anything about this stuff, but hopefully we'll get somebody on with some Linux experience and some X11 experience to uh, basically tell me more about what that all means. So that's who's coming up. Uh, we got, uh, you can go to the big spreadsheet, from the homepage of the show, twit.tv slash Foss. And if you have any other suggestions, please tell the project leader or the community coordinator to email me. That's how most of these got on the schedule here. And uh, especially if it's not cryptocurrency. I don't want to do any more crypto shows until the end of the year if I can help it. <laughs> we'll see if I can make good on that promise except for these two that are coming up. Um, we have a live stream at uh, 9.30 a.m. Pacific time on Wednesdays at live.twit.tv. We take a number of questions from there. Uh, Emily the Strange was uh, uh, kind enough to mm. give us a couple questions for today. Um, uh, a couple others chimed in, too, but I think we're okay. Um, uh, we follow us at Floss Weekly on Google+, Plus and at Floss Weekly on Twitter. You can follow me at Randall L. Schwartz on Google+, Plus and at Merlin on Twitter. Uh, I'm plugging so far that uh, I was on Software Engineering Daily. It's an audio podcast uh, on July 11th, uh, back a little ways. Uh, if you just Google, I, I couldn't find a short link for this. If you just Google my name, and Software Engineering Daily, I did a one-hour show on Flutter and why Flutter is important to me and why it's important to everyone. I'll be at uh, DragonCon coming up in the next weekend, I guess. Yeah, not this weekend, but next weekend, right? Labor Day weekend. So if you're there, uh, please come up and say hi and say you're a listener of the show. That'll be really nice for me to meet some of my um, audience. Uh, I've got five sessions there. I'm on the EFF track, five different sessions. Uh, most of them are panels, but I'm doing my Flutter talk there again. Uh, I'm at All Things Open in Raleigh. North Carolina in October. I am both press and speaker there. I'm actually doing my Flutter talk there as well. It just got accepted, which is really nice. I'm at Siegel, uh, which we had uh, the uh, the uh, the maker, the the guy, the guy for the show uh, on 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 this show. That guy, uh, and that guy. That guy the guy that was from Siegel, yeah. right? It's a Seattle the other Linux guy. show. Yeah, <laughs> the other guy. See, I'll be there in November, and I just got invited to go as press to KubeCon in December. So all, all things Kubernetes. So that'll be a lot of fun. And that's also in Seattle as well. So I'm going to be heading to Seattle uh, twice, about a month apart, which is great because my brother lives like two-thirds of the way up there. So I'll be able to see him and my mom on my way up and down twice. So it'll be really great. All right, so that's all I have to cover so far. Uh, Dan, anything you want to plug? Yeah, actually, it's quite a, a significant day. Actually, I've I just launched a new podcast uh, last night, funnily enough, uh, which is wow. called Tales. Yeah, it's called Tales of the Unattested, which is uh, I was really proud of that kind of punish name. But basically, it's um it's a confessional podcast where people can send us their confessions anonymously, and we talk about them. Uh, my friend Caroline and I talk about them, and it's um it's very kind of fun and, and silly and, and all the rest of it but it's, it's it's an interesting show during the first show we talked about um the favorite funerals we've ever, our favorite funerals we've ever been to so it's a bit of a strange show but it's very uh very interesting and funny and lots of comic book references and other stuff in there so if you want to find it the first episode just came out last night as i said um if you either search for tales of the unattested or, or my name if you go to danlynch.org which is uh, on the thing there or look at my twitter um you can find it on there and the web address is unattested.podfactory.org but um, keep an eye on my Twitter and other things that so you can find it on there. Other than that, I, I actually ha had a really good chat with Simon, Simon Phipps, at the weekend in person uh, in Sheffield. I went to Og Camp, and Simon's the treasurer for Og Camp now. So he turned up and uh, he had this Og Camp crew shirt on, and I was thinking, what are you doing here? And then I noticed he had a crew shirt on. So we had a good 20, 30 minute discussion about licenses and other things. Mm. So uh, lots of exciting stuff there. So uh, yeah, just cool. keep up with Twitter and other things if you want to know what I'm doing and uh, check out the new podcast. Are you also going to spin off a show from unattested to be Tales of the Unit Tested? <laughs> Talk about testing? Oh, 
That could be a software one, couldn't it? Yeah, that's a really good idea <laughs> yeah. we could do. Yeah, yeah. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> Tales of the Unit Tested. Yeah, that would that would yeah. be a great misspelling of that. Well, Dan, thanks for uh, being on the show once again and uh, and uh, helping me out because this, this is area, obviously, I was sort of struggling with a little bit and you apparently had slightly more experience with, so that was nice. <laughs> Um, mm -hmm. always handy when that works out. And also just always, uh, it's always handy to have a co-host for this show because occasionally I get stuck and need to go review things real quickly. And, uh, people don't know this but behind the scenes. That's what we do a lot of us. Uh, we're actually handing off back and forth as we each get stuck. The other one takes over for a mm. while and we, we basically call it regrouping in our, in our back chat chat room. So that's great. So Dan, thanks once mm -hmm. again, and we'll see you all again next week from this very same location on Floss Weekly. <laughs> <laughs>